tiene. Humbug. Christmas of a humbug? You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. I call Merry Christmas if I have my will. Every idiot who goes with Merry Christmas on his lips should be bored of his own pudding. He should. Uncle! Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it! Let me leave it alone then. Much good it may be, much good it has ever done you. I have always thought Christmas time as a kind, as a good time, but kind, forgiving, Terrible, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Good afternoon. I will keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. of the year, Mrs. Scrooge used to take some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. A few of us are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the meat, to buy the poorest meat and drink. What shall I get down for you? Nothing. You wish to be unanimous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me why I wish, a gentleman, that is my answer. I don't marry, my, make marry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make other people marry. I help to support the prisons and the workhouses. They cost enough. Those who are probably all must go there. Many can't go there. Many would rather die. If they'd rather die, they had better do it. The hour should not the town house arrived. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern and went home to bed. Now, it is a fact there was nothing all particular about the knocker on the door of this house, except that it was very large. And yet, Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw the knocker, not a knocker, but Marley's face. As Scrooge looked at this again, it was the knocker again. And he closed the door with a bang. He sounded. The sound of thunder to the house like thunder. Every room above and every cask in the wine merchant's cellar below appeared to have a separate peal of echoes of its own. Scrooge was not a man to be frightened by echoes. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs. Up Scrooge went, not caring a button for being very dark. Darkness is the street, and Scrooge liked it. Quite satisfied, he closed his door and locked himself in. Double locked himself in, which was not his custom. Thus, he scared against his pride. He put on his dressing gown, his slippers, and his nightcap, and sat down before the very low fire to take his girl. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened upon a bell, a disgust bell, that hung in the room. It was with the great astonishment and a strange dread that as he looked, he saw the bell begin to swing. Soon it rang out loudly, and so did every bell in the house. This was seated by a clanky noise. Deep down below, as if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the castings in the wine merchant's cellar, then they heard the noise much louder. On the floorboards, then coming up the stairs, then coming straight towards this door. It came on through the heavy door. And as the spectator passed in the room before his eyes, and upon it coming in, the dying slave leaped upon and threw its cry. Bell! What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. The girl sat down on the opposite side of the fireplace, as if he was quite used to it. You don't believe in me? I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blob of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more gravy than grave about you, whatever you are. The spirit raised a frightful cry. Ooh! Mercy, dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Why do spirits walk the earth, and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him shall walk amongst his fellow men and travel far and wide. 
and if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me! And my spirit never rolled beyond our money-changing hole, and weary journeys lie before me! Scrooge was very much dismayed to hear the spectator going on at this rate. It began to quake exceedingly. You will be haunted by three spirits. Expect the first tomorrow night when the bell tolls one. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. Expect the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve empty fifths look to see me no more. to me. I am. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. As the words were spoken, they passed through the fruits of the city. It was made plain enough by the dressings of the shops that here too it was Christmas time. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door. Do you know it? Know it? I apprenticed here. They went in at a sight of an old man and an old gentleman in a fellowship's wig. Sitting behind such a high death that if it had been two inches taller, he might have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great excitement on a winter's night. In came a fluorist with the music box. and went up to a lofty desk and made an orchestra of it. And tuned like 50 stomach ache. In came Mrs. Fizzlewig, one vast mile. In came three Mrs. Fizzlewigs, beaming and lovable. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. And they all came, anyhow and every how. Away they all went, 20 couples at once. Heads half round and back again, the other way. Down the middle and up again, round, round, round. All top couples always turned up in the wrong places. When the clock struck 11, this ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezzy Wig shaking hands with every person as he or she went out, wishing him or her a Merry Christmas. Small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. He only spent but a few of your pounds, three or four perhaps. Is it for this that he deserves this much praise? It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service pleasure or toil. Say, say that his power lies in words and looks. What then? Happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. Spirit, remove me from this place. Haunt me no longer.
woken in his bedroom. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked like a perfect groove. The leaves and holly and mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, great joints of meat, pigs, long grapes to sausage, meat pies, plum pudding, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheek apples, juicy oranges, luscious pears, great bowls of punch, and the meat's twelve fish cakes. Upon there stood a giant glory to see, who bore a glowing torch. Come in, come in, and know me, better man. I'm the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You have never seen the light of me before. Never. Ha, ha, ha. Touch my room. Scrooge as he was told, and held it fast. The room and all its contents vanished instantly, and they stood in the city streets upon a snowy Christmas morning. Scrooge and the ghost passed on, invisible, straight to Scrooge's clerk. And on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled and stopped to Bob bless Bob and stopped to Bob and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. Then up rose Miss Cratchit. Wherever has your brother and your father tiny been? No, no, there's father coming. Golden better. Somehow he gets so thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you've ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and might have been glimpsed to remember the poor Christmas day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. At last, the dinner was all done. The clerk was cleared, the harp was swept, and the fire made up. Then all the crafty family drew around the harp, while the chestnuts on the fire sputtled and crackled noisily. They were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and content with the time. And when they faded and looked happier yet in the bright sprinklings of the spirit George at parting, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim until the last. But the whole scene passed off. And he and the spirit were again upon their travels. Much they saw and far they went, and many homes they visit. But it was with a happy ending. Suddenly as they stood together in an open place, the bell struck twelve.
ghosts of the future. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. Will you not speak to me? Lead on, lead on. The night is waning fast, and it's precious time to me. Lead on, spirit. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather to spring up about them. But then they were in the heart among the merchants. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Observing that the hand was pointed to them, Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. I don't know much about it either. I only know he's dead. When did he die? Mathematically. What did he do with his money? Comforting, perhaps. He hasn't left any of the means. That's all I know. The scene had changed, and now he almost touched a bare, uncurtained bed. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon this bed. And on it, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this unknown man. Spirit, let me see some tenderness connected with a death. The ghost consciousness of poor Bob Cratchit's house, the only had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Quiet, very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were still statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in needlework, but surely they were very quiet. The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hands up to her face. The color hurts my eyes. They're better now. It weakens them by candlelight, and I wouldn't dare show weak eyes to your father for the world. It's past his time. Past it, rather. But I think he's walked a little slower than he's used to these past few evenings, mother. I, I've known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. But he was very light to carry, and your father loved him so. There's father now. Don't mind it, father. Don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them. He spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table and praised Miss Cratchit and the girls. You went today, then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you some good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it, Popper. I promised him I'd walk over there on a Sunday. My little, my little child, my little child. Spirit, something informs me that our party moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me who, what man that was we saw with his cup with the covered face, whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come to him to a dismal, wretched, ruinous churchyard. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and followed the finger, read upon the stone in the neglected grave, his own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man? Who, am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit. Oh no, no. Hear me. I am past. I am. I'm not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. I am past all hope. Assure me that I may change these shadows you have shown me. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all year. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Holding up his hands in one last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw alternation in the phantom's hood. In the dress, it shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, in the bedpost? was his own. The bed was his own, the room was his own. Best and happiness of all. The time before him was his own, to make amends in. He checked in his transports by the churches, ringing out the luckiest peals he has ever heard. What's today? Yeah? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why Christmas Day? It's Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know where, where the culture is on foot? Exit next street, but one at the corner? I should hope I do. A intelligent boy, a remarkable boy. Do you know whether they sold the price turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little one, the big one. A delightful boy. It's a pleasure to be talking to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Please. 
No, no, I'm in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may show him the direction where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with the man in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shouldn't know who sends it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Scrooge dressed himself all in his best and laughed out into the streets. The people by this time pouring forth. As he had seen them, as he had, as he had seen them with the pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present, and walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded everyone with a delightful smile. He looked so irresistibly pleasant in a word that three good-humored fellows said, "Good morning, sir. A merry Christmas to you." He was early at the office next morning. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. Bob was a full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Bob's hat was off before he opened the door. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen, as if he was trying to overtake the nine o'clock. Hello, what do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I'm so very sorry, sir, I'm behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Now step this way, if you please. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand for a sort of thing any longer. And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. And Merry Christmas, Bob. And Merry Christmas, Bob, that I've given you much a, many a year. I, was, I will raise your salary and assist us to eat deep and deeper your struggling family. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all and if any more. 